Nun folgt der Vortrag Mehr schlecht als recht, Grauzone Sicherheitsforscher mit Dominik und Fabian. With Dominic and Fabian, we now have the talk. Imagine you are researchers, you want to look at a piece of software to understand how it works, and you do what you usually do, reverse engineering, and you find a security hole. And uh, yeah, looking at the program in this Congress, that seems to be pretty common. But suddenly, an attorney uh, writes you a letter, and now that's the story that Dominic and Fabian will tell us. Warmly welcome. They, those two people. Thank you. Yeah, Fabian and I are uh, going to talk here. Why are we here? Yeah, it has something to do with uh, legal stuff. Disclaimer, yeah, we are no lawyers. <laughs> Uh, um, it's uh, not Leute, just uh, concerning us, but uh, in total eight people who were involved, two uh, completely uh, independent uh, groups, the team FAU uh, from Erlangen, three people, and uh, me, uh, who is currently at TU Berlin, and the team uh, TUM from the Technical University Munich, uh, three people and Fabian, and uh, also one more from uh, TU Eindhoven, but uh, he was then, yeah, ignored. But it's okay, he didn't quite complain. The uh, only commonality here is that we uh, don't really trust any solution that uh, advertises absolute security. Now, who does that is uh, here the uh, claimant. And uh, who says, yeah, well, uh, we, we give us your software and uh, we'll just make it secure, even if you have a systems with malware. And why are uh, we two groups uh, looking at this? And that's because, yeah, that claimant is uh, pretty widespread here in Germany. So last year we looked at that and from uh, there we uh, had some publications here in the Süddeutsche uh, newspapers end of uh, last year. On the right side, you can see the timeline. Blue is the FAU and green the TUM. So we reported that, and without any more details, we had this article. And uh, a month later, we had this uh, talk at a at the conference. And from uh, from there, we built a paper. A uh, scientific paper that we presented at uh, DIMVA uh, of this year. We here didn't look just at the claimant, but also uh, at uh, other companies uh, on the market. And that was, uh, yeah, our, th our thing, and then it was gone. Now, Fabian. Yeah, thanks, Dominic. There are here, uh, yeah, two timelines, and uh, some of those are well happening at the same time. So at the tomb, we had a friend of mine who looked at the Elster app, and uh, then he noticed that uh, some things there, uh, um, yeah, were already mentioned at uh, 34 C3. And at that time, the paper at DIMVA was uh, conditionally accepted, and so some things of our analysis also went into that paper. What we also found was uh, white box cryptography that was uh, also used as an uh, additional uh, piece in the software. And uh, yeah, we wanted to look at that uh, white box crypto and uh, wanted to uh, have it, uh, yeah, to analyze it in uh, academic context. And then we uh, try to publish a paper there and, uh, yeah, got it at the Usenix Workshop of Offensive Technologies 18 and uh, got it conditionally accepted about a month later. Didn't we really uh, count on that? 
And then we were a little bit surprised. Uh, we got surprised for the first time. Uh, a couple of weeks after the conditional acceptance, uh, we got an email from the CTO of the claimant um, with the subject responsible disclosure violation, and uh, we were a little bit uh, surprised because our findings, uh, which we did uh, with uh, reverse engineering, didn't didn't really indicate any security leak or opening. The results that we had uh, did we uh, supply to the company and uh, discussed uh, various aspects of the paper with them. Yeah, surprise. We, uh, as I said before, we actually thought this was uh, done and uh, closed, didn't really want to do any more, and suddenly we got this uh, officially looking uh, thing, uh, first by email and then by snail mail, please sign that. Uh, we usually call that a warning letter. Uh, that was an email from uh, the lawyer who, yeah, basically uh, that was a uh, cease and desist declaration that they uh, sent us and we only had two working days to sign that and uh, that was uh, due to uh, doing hacking things uh, like copyright and uh, also yeah we had uh, did bad things for a competition and they basically wanted us to no longer do any reverse engineering of the software of the claimant um, no longer circumvent any protection measures. We, we weren't no, anymore allowed to do that because uh, that, of course, would lead to imperfect uh, protection by them. And when it's forbidden, then the protection is perfect, of course, and no publication about it and do not have or own uh, software that that um, does what we do so and never do what you do for for life and uh, pay up to 10,000 euros if you violate the conditions and uh, legal consequences were also uh, threatened uh, even if you sign that you might still do that and we can still do uh, legal things against you and luckily um, I wasn't I was at the university and I'm a researcher and I called our legal department and and they said the legal department said oh we no problem we we take care of that and uh, with that I, I was I was done and I'm, I'm done with this talk as well because I have no longer anything to do with it and back to Fabian Okay, that would have been nice if it would have been that easy at Munich. In Munich, we also got this this letter by email uh, as a preliminary version on a fr on, on a Friday afternoon. We were still sitting in a meeting um, at the at our uh, my professor, or my PhD mentor, and uh, they just called the legal department and. University, maybe, uh, do you know what happens if you call someone on a Friday at 4 p.m.? And, and actually there still was someone there um, and uh, reacted to, to that and, uh, and they said, oh, the um, Mr. So-and-so isn't there anymore. Um, I'll tell him on Monday, first thing in the morning. And here's a small calendar and to show how close that was. Uh, the 24th was the, the de deadline. Uh, until then, we should have sent it back. And then maybe we could evade legal consequences. So maybe there's several legal consequences. Nothing happened on the weekend. And we had to wait uh, the weekend without having being able to do anything. On the 23rd and 24th, uh, we uh, phoned the, the legal department continuously several times and tried somehow to explain to them what had happened. And they, they really didn't 
didn't know what the world, what happened and what, what went wrong there. And so we told them the history and we had some uh, discussion with them and we told them the paper, we gave them the paper, a preliminary version of the paper and I don't want to denigrate uh, legal persons, but they have a different area of expertise. We do our research and now suddenly we are supposed to tell them uh, what our analysis techniques are and what the legal consequences are of that and that's very difficult and the legal department uh, didn't weren't really cool about that they said oh my god what we we uh, tell the the chancellor and the vice chancellor and see if we if, if maybe we have to pay damages or anything like that or maybe um, after for according to foreign law or something it wasn't wasn't uh, well the legal department then asked for an extension of the deadline and this is uh, the letter to the lawyer of our of the claimant and we asked for an extension of the deadline until july and that would have been uh, a week more and we received uh, an extension of one day yes thank you all right. So we have to cl clear that with our legal department. We have to talk to them. And they really looked into legal articles. And uh, a day later, there was another interesting thing. And we can only prepare the, the letter. And we cannot sign that. There's your name on the letter. And you have to sign that. And it's and the university is not party to the to the proceedings so you have to sign that personally we couldn't really understand that and we really um, had to sign that the, the cease and desist declaration um, and send it back to the claimant um, pre just briefly just just remind me I forgot it completely it wasn't exactly as it was they they said oh it was your name and you have to sign it and you should really talk to a lawyer and we have nothing to do with that and that was really wonderful <laughs> really great so the legal background fabian please okay what follows now we didn't know it at that time at all that's just what we found out afterwards and everything that, that is to come in this in this talk so we are not lawless, lawyers and we didn't really know that but i tried to explain to you what the problem is um, legally as far as we understand uh, for our analysis of the software we used uh, different methods from the reverse engineer engineering toolkit that's uh, green yeah and there's for example decompiling different uh, static analysis methods that you can for example put it execute it in an emulator not directly on the on the hardware but you can use emulate emulator and look slowly what it does and execute it in a debugger for example and you can see the register values changing uh, or disassembly and maybe can a debugger can do that and uh, legally you must never decompile it is forbidden according to various articles in the copyright law in German copyright law and um, it depends on uh, which lawyer you ask maybe it's also according to um, law about uh, competition and uh, you may not um, get knowledge from a competitor in that way um, but uh, testing and so is is uh, is allowed and um, all that's in the middle in between testing and decompiling we, we don't really know according to which articles you read legal articles you read um, we asked and nobody was really able to tell us we had um, really talked to lawyers ourselves and they also said we don't really know it hasn't been clarified and according in on uh, regarding decompiling there's one exception if you have to create uh, interoperability then you can do that and there's a um, an api and you want to connect to that and there's one uh, one interface and for reasons of being uh, remaining competitive you may perhaps do that under certain conditions and uh, execute it in an emulator we asked our lawyers and it's probably rather forbidden 
So you have to really really look at that. So the idea is maybe, yeah, well, then the program isn't executed in its natural environment anymore. So, yeah, it's difficult. In static analysis, we also, sometimes, some are of the opinion that disassembly is already forbidden, disassembling. And if you really just use the um, hex codes and uh, then have the opcodes in your mind, that's allowed. But if you use a tool for that, for disassembling, that's uh, forbidden, perhaps. And our goal was really, um, we really wanted, we had no, we really weren't looking for, for a struggle. We weren't looking for a fight, but what can we do without compromising our scientific integrity and to really make it more acceptable to the claimant and we just we talked to them and some formula some sentences we we uh, took out maybe and we couldn't really say we we struck out something that we couldn't uh, well well in the end we we really retracted the paper um, and uh, so we that's a consequence of the ex our acceptance of the cease and desist declaration really and then we went on holiday and hoped that the storm was over yeah so we had a weekend of uh, calm and quiet here we have an unboxing video of uh, what came in the next week so, uh, yeah, it's not really uh, reusable, but uh, a lot of content. And you can see here uh, a large uh, volume, a large amount of papers. And that was the letter from the... Uh, the court and uh, they wanted here a preliminary injunction but the court said this is a very complex uh, topic so uh, yeah, and there's a, a large sum of money involved here and the, the court can just accept that the injunction or uh, the court says yeah we, we want to uh, have here a, a a real uh, process here with uh, lawyers and uh, people need to be there personally so after a lot of uh, a lot of communication we we wanted to yeah go there and see what happens but uh, there was a lot of uh, writing uh, to the court to 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 show that the the opposing side uh, was uh, yeah kind of talking out of their behinds and uh, then we met in the courtroom and was pretty full and they never had such a, a full civil process uh, it was very interesting it was a long uh, process. Our lawyer thought it would be two hours, then in the end it was seven. And yeah, there, there were some interesting uh, small gems that happened there. For example, the, the lawyers of the claimant said things like, the security of the software of our client is, is, cannot really uh, be guaranteed if we discuss this security in public. So that was, yeah, interesting. The court did uh, their job pretty well. They, they actually looked into the whole topic. And the court writer went home at some point because she... Uh, was done with her shift and seven hours later the the third uh, person in the court they wrote down that we had here a uh, responsible dis disclosure uh, process and that was uh, what we told them and uh, 
in return, we were able to actually publish our findings. And uh, with this uh, responsible disclosure procedure, we would tell them, oh, we want to publish something and uh, we give you X amount of days. And then they could answer and say, ah, oh, yes, we have some comments here, or maybe, maybe wait a little bit and we will patch something. But yeah, we were, uh, we were able to actually keep the right to publish and that they would actually pay for any court costs. And uh, yeah, afterwards we had also some uh, press uh, echo here. So yeah, did we did we get our to our end goal? So yeah, we had a lot of stress for eight researchers with uh, a lot of things that we could never really dream of. We uh, never really could answer these uh, legal uh, gray area issues. So yeah, about decompilation, for example, and the paper of the Technical University of Munich is. Uh, still uh, not published. So, lessons learned. So don't panic. Um, it's a, just a standard thing. I didn't panic enough. And Well, it's, it's weekend and on Monday the university will take care of it. Uh, no, not really. Um, and don't sign something blindly without knowing what it is. If we had just, um, just signed it, we just could have stopped doing our job, right? Uh, uni, university lawyers, uh, legal experts are not IT experts, so um, it wasn't easy to explain to them what the problem was, and the FAU was um, a lot better, their legal department, um, yeah, whatever. Um, don't overdo it, uh, don't uh, exaggerate in publications, Maybe we sometimes tend to, to exaggerate and uh, and if we put in things that maybe legally um, not quite correct, then um, if you put the name of the company in it or something like that, that may be a, a problem. And of course, do never ever use a decompiler, not, not at all, not ever. And you just can't do that here in Germany. But uh, the the burden of proof is is on the claimant in that case. Um, if someone uh, accidentally uses it, uses it, and um, and, uh, and never, never, never ever write it in the paper. And uh, of course, there are um, there can be demands by the claimant or something, but but never ever decompile. So and. Um, there are some questions that have come up and we'd like to answer those. Um, so ma before we come to the end, um, of course, during during the process, we had our questions ourselves and, and got questions from other people and and we are going through a best of, of the questions right now. So the judges um, during the hearing, they they really let us look um, into how they how they saw it. So please um, tell the claimant you, you cannot cannot be successful with your claims here with this, with this court. So why did we settle in the end? And uh, so what we got was uh, there was a preliminary injunction and we got this, uh, this warning letter and the way you rejected it. And because that is a pre preliminary injunction that goes to the to the state court and uh, into revision in the upper state court and um, and there is a decision, but then there is another proceeding about the injunction proper. And uh, in Bavaria, you have to do that within one month after you know it, uh, and, and then you can't get a preliminary injunction because it is no longer urgent. And uh, but you can all also try to to um, get the same things done in the proper injunction proceedings. And uh, 
Wo so, waren wir denn jetzt? so wo, wir where were we? we uh, there was this uh, five-step um, thing here. We ignited that and we were at the state court and maybe, maybe a, 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 a sentence would have ended in our favor. And the lawyers of the Technical University of Munich, they, they knew in our team, they already knew that most companies have don't really want to discuss the security of the software in an, in, a, in court proceedings in a court of law and in this case it, that wasn't the case in our in our case and with the settlement there's a uh, compensation clause and uh, they can't ever do anything with that they can't go into revision um, and those four additional stages um, they They can't go through uh, the other instances, and it doesn't work, and we don't have to do it, and our cl the claimant also doesn't have to do it. And uh, maybe we wouldn't have had been able to go the long way, and so maybe for us the settlement was the better way for us, and we really wanted to do responsible disclosure. And uh, in this case, maybe it wasn't so good, and we are sorry for that, but um, perhaps a mistake. But we could also um, ask experts uh, in the court, and there are um, deadlines to be observed, and we didn't want to be sitting on a, on a ticking bomb. And the next problem is, can an IT researcher Uh, be silenced by legal means. Hmm. That's uh, hard to say. Maybe, maybe not. So it didn't work in our case. We uh, fought for our rights to continue our research, uh, especially at the U University of Munich, so we can still publish it. We have no non-disclosure non agreement. We can talk to you about it, and we do that and raise awareness for this problem so that hopefully you don't have to suffer the same thing. On the other hand side, we have a feeling that nothing has really been, been clarified or the nuances of the analysis that maybe you can always construct a reason for legally reasonable reason that maybe they have a point with this claim and maybe if you don't want to go through all the courts then they can can still effectively silence the researchers and, and the pressure is really enormous and that was really maybe the most stressful summer that I've ever had. So who represents university security researchers? So people ask me um, you, uh, you are dependent researchers from the university. Why doesn't the university take care of that? And why that works, I can't really tell you from a legal perspective. There's a Bavarian uh, state state employee law and some paragraphs. I don't exactly know uh, what that is. Um, for Bavarian civil servants and I don't know really what it is and we have no, no final answer and maybe the Bavarian Ministry for Science has to work on that and in the case of our university that hasn't been clarified finally. So how do you, how do you um, work with, uh, with your side jobs if you do other jobs beside your university employment, pen testing or something like that? How do you um, deal with that. If, if maybe in, the, in this in this warning letter it, it happens could could happen that they say oh they have a company it's a, it's a it's a competitor and uh, much stricter rules apply for them and that is quite a critical point and luckily the judges didn't bring that up and didn't say that do they make a competition product uh, no they don't but maybe the the danger is still is still there. So, what what would we have liked to have? It would have been uh, very cool if, if we could uh, cover this risk of being sued by a company. So, if the worst case actually comes to pass, if there is no settlement, or if we have to go through all these five instances that we uh, don't have to uh, pay that ourselves. 
maybe uh, yeah you you can get some money back again if if you actually um, win in the in the proceedings but yeah and yeah you can also lose so would be cool if there's uh, yeah some sort of insurance for that and uh, then yeah there's a this is a copyright thing so um, copyright is usually uh, not included uh, because of this uh, file sharing that has happened. And if you get sued for uh, impinging on uh, the competition, then yeah, that's also not really included. So yeah, those are the two things that aren't really covered. So yeah, would be cool if there's some kind of insurance or policy for that. Then the research institutes, if we could get some uh, support there, because we didn't quite... There, there were a lot of people there who, who actually uh, made an effort and uh, they really tried, but uh, in the end, yeah, there, there uh, was some kind of uh, restriction and they couldn't quite go uh, the whole way. And yeah, there's... There's this feeling that, yeah, there was some kind of uh, resistance here in the system that uh, they uh, didn't quite want to uh, stand by, for example, external, also researchers, uh, students. And also, yeah, some kind of legal protection here. And uh, if they also, if they can also be sued for uh, your research or not. But... Uh, yeah, so we, we thought about that, but we didn't quite want to pursue that avenue. Then would be uh, cool a legal basis for a security research, which would ideally uh, allow all, all kinds of analyses, uh, including decompiling. Um, because, uh, yeah, we had this copyright uh, issue and uh, in the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, since 2016 there is an exception for security research. And if we had such an exception, then maybe many legal questions here could be quenched and uh, we had a, a more security um, concerning this issue because, yeah, legal people can't not really judge uh, all of these technical issues. And that was our talk. Now it's time for questions. Vielen Dank erstmal für diese Vorstellung. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation of this uh, of your suffering. It's really scary. And now we have a Q&A. Whoever has a question, please come forward to one of the microphones. And I really think questions 1.0. There's one sentence with a question mark at the end. At the end, so get close to the microphone. Um, don't touch it, but click the close. Whoever has to go now, please keep quiet so you don't disturb the rest. Please, microphone number two. Thank you for this exciting story. Uh, who, uh, talking about the costs, that is uh, not normal that one side uh, bears all the costs. Could you uh, please give an indication how high the costs were, the costs of the, the court? Um, so there is here like a, a lawyer cost table that probably doesn't uh, is not called like that and that that's just how the costs are calculated and uh, it was like 200,000 euros in the end and that's just like the the initial uh, cost uh, estimate but uh, that's not necessarily what is actually due in the end and uh, then in the end, it's just the costs for the court and the lawyers. Yes, mic number one. One question that you could answer with yes or no. Is there, were there um, consequences for one of you eight to, uh, with your employment? Yes. The, yeah, we, we are uh, 
two different teams and one of eight, uh, definitely. There were consequences, but not for uh, us two uh, from a professional perspective, but uh, psychologically seen, yes, uh, also definitely some consequences. I personally am glad that I actually did that, and I'm also quite happy. Hey. Three. Hey. Did your lawyers ever answer the question if uh, what was there in the legal text as, as decompiling, was that really the same thing that we think of as technicians when, when we use decompiling? Is it just pressing a five or is it just uh, uh, change the compiled program into another form? Yeah, this is, this is why it's a gray area in security research. That's that's why we had uh, this figure because uh, many things might actually fall under decompilation. Uh, there is this the the decompiling uh, paragraph in the law. It actually says yes, it's decompiling, and there is no uh, further like uh, details on what uh, is actually understood as decompilation. So. I cannot really answer what a lawyer would say as uh, decompiling, so disassembly could also be interpreted as that. And that's why a court needs to decide that. So we could only say, yeah, we, we don't really know if there's there's any uh, pre, uh, pre-existing uh, decisions here, so that's something that should really need to be cleared up, legally speaking. All we can say is, yeah, opinions, and every judge can can decide differently here. Is there a question from the internet? Uh, the question is um, that students and researchers have a right of, to uh, to an insurance, and it's not really a clear question. Rather, shouldn't everyone have the right for an insurance if they if they use their own software for looking for security problems? Yeah, it would be really nice if there if there was a insurance company that could actually insure against these risks. So uh, we had this uh, legal protection insurance. Um, they w wouldn't have paid for for that uh, exact case because we did it afterwards, and uh, we informed ourselves. But yeah, we we discovered that even if we had that legal protection insurance, maybe we would have had the same problem because those issues are not covered by the police. And yeah, you should really be able to look at it yourself. But yeah, that law should maybe be changed. The CCC also uses some, does something like that. If someone finds data or obtains data one way or another, that they also uh, support them. Did you contact the CCC and how did that work? Yeah, we have uh, different uh, experiences here. I had a close contact with CCC. We uh, also got our lawyers uh, recommended from CCC. And uh, yeah, two thumbs up for for that if you have something like that. But uh, with eight people from uh, our side, I, I don't want to uh, denigrate CCC here. Maybe we had some miscommunication. But uh, yeah, we, we didn't quite get as much support as we maybe would have liked. The, the Nuremberg Research Group that was uh, represented by one lawyer, but that lawyer didn't want to represent us. And although that was maybe completely, com completely uh, um, detached experiences here with, a, with another exact same case, but um, the lawyer didn't want to do it because of conflicts of interest. So yeah, there was that. Number one, please. Yes, thank you very much for the presentation. And uh, the question with the unclarified parts and the... Uh, wouldn't it have been nice to really get a, a sentence, a precedence, and uh, not just settle? In my opinion, 
in the end, we could have only proven that it's not provable that we didn't decompile. So that is probably the, the only thing that yeah, would have resulted in that process, and maybe we could have lost, and that would have sucked. So, yeah. So, you think that, that the other the other side should have should have fought before court to the end and it was about uh, the, the technologies that the techniques that can be used in security research so that we had a decision if they were legal or not yeah the, the problem is with uh, this issue is that we had uh, eight researchers that also were uh, busy doing other things. Uh, some of them weren't even affiliated with uh, Technical University anymore. And uh, then you have this long process, two or three years, and uh, we just wanted to, to meet and uh, I was uh, basically doing switchboard duty just to communicate everything and to to keep that uh, over several years that would have been a nightmare and also a huge psychological pressure and uh, with with uh, court proceedings you you just want to get the low hanging fruit and uh, you you go after the small technical things like a missing paragraph in in a document the, the document isn't uh, coherent formally and uh, so so you don't start with uh, this uh, yeah what is decompilation and and how does it pertain uh, we we start with uh, uh, your your actually your your letters are are not correct so in the end if we actually had come to this decompilation thing it's completely open okay the time is up who still has questions, maybe the two speakers are still there for a while and please come to the front to talk to them. Otherwise, we, this concludes the talk and please another warm hand for the two presenters. Yeah, and that was uh, Legally Bad, Grey Areas in Security Research. Your translators were chopping...